Christ within me, Christ behind me, Christ before me, Christ beside me, Christ within me, Christ to comfort and restore me, Christ to be with me, Christ within me. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God, now and forever. Amen. be with you. Let us pray. Holy Trinity, you are neither monarch nor monologue, but an eternal harmony of gift and response. Through the uncreated word and the spirit of truth, include us and all creation in your extravagant love, through the wisdom of God who raises her voice to call us to life. Amen. A reading from Proverbs. Does not wisdom call and does not understanding raise her voice? On the heights, beside the way, at the crossroads she takes her stand. Beside the gates in front of the town, at the entrance of the portal she cries out, to you, O people, I call, and my cry is to all that live. The Lord created me at the beginning of his work the first of his acts of long ago. Ages ago I was set up at the first, before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth, when there were no springs abounding with water. Before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills I was brought forth, when he had not yet made earth and fields. 
or the world's first bits of soil. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit, so that the waters might not transgress his command. When he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master worker. And I was daily in his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world, and delighting in the human race. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. reading from Romans. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus said to his disciples, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. 
The Gospel of the Lord. In April of 1991, four months from my 21st birthday, I came out as gay, first to a Lutheran pastor who counseled me, and then to friends, then siblings, and then my parents. Finally, I wrote a letter to my Uncle Ray, my dad's brother, letting him know. Uncle Ray was an understanding person. He was a well-read newspaper editor in a small town. Worthington, Minnesota, my birthplace. And he was an accomplished historian. He also had a delightful sense of humor and a way with writing. His letter back to me did not disappoint. Damn discrimination, he began, and he repeated it. Damn discrimination. Uncle Ray lamented the difficulty so many people had with sexual orientation in that era an era all too similar to this one. He assured me that he was an ally. Then he gave me some advice. He urged me not to tell Grandma, his mother. She was 83 years old, and she had lived her whole life in one place. Though I most likely would not suffer her judgment or rejection, it would just be difficult for her to make sense of the news. Grandma eventually met my husband, Andrew, and for all I know, she drew correct conclusions about who I was and just kept her own counsel about it. But it did seem to be good advice all the same. She died in 2005, and we never had that conversation. But we parted in peace. While I am still persuaded that my uncle advised me well, I also have a lingering worry about my own 80-something self. I am fortunate enough to live that long, that is. I have often told myself, I don't want to be one of those people who can't be told things because people think I wouldn't understand. I want to be open to change, to new ideas. I want to be corrected, even confronted. This week, someone posted on social media the idea that people over 50 should find 20-something mentors. <laughs> And note, the older person is the mentee. My friend Josh is under 30, and I made a comment tagging him, saying, I want Josh to be my mentor. The younger person can keep the older person informed, explain shifts in the culture, correct them when they fall behind on something important. I like that idea. And all of this fits well with our faith as Christians. Ours is a faith of growth learning and development. Christians don't do well when we stay safe with our long-held assumptions. We need to grow. And so today we hear Jesus say, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. This enigmatic saying has inspired the interpretation that faith is never about certitude and always about learning something new. Former Episcopal presiding bishop Frank Griswold quoted Jesus saying this. He was being interviewed about the destructive schism that had torn the Episcopal Church apart on his watch following the 2003 election and consecration of New Hampshire Bishop Gene Robinson, the first out gay and partnered bishop in our communion. Bishop Robinson was at the center of a traumatic upheaval that led to congregations and whole dioceses leaving the Episcopal Church and many rancorous legal fights about property and polity. Presiding Bishop Griswold, when asked about homosexuality in the church, recalled Jesus' words that Jesus has many things to say to us, but we cannot bear them now. If some of us struggle with the full acceptance of LGBTQ persons in the church, and if others of us struggle with the full acceptance of opponents to full inclusion, we would all do well to reflect on Jesus' words. 
What might we not be able to bear right now? And what might Jesus still say to us when we are ready to hear it? In the summer of 2015, in Salt Lake City, I served as a deputy to General Convention, the year we elected Michael Curry to be our presiding bishop. That same year, new marriage rights, R-I-T-E-S, for all couples, including same-sex couples, were approved. I use these blessings now when I plan weddings with couples and have appreciated that heterosexual couples like them too. These prayers set aside male and female language in a way that works well for all couples. And they were written well with sound scholarship and vivid creativity. But that summer at General Convention, something happened that disturbed me. On the day that the new texts were approved, at the evening Eucharist, many people were in a celebratory mood. This was understandable, and I shared their enthusiasm. The state of Washington had legalized marriage for all couples just two years before, and now my church was following suit. Of course I was glad about this, but I found that I was not glad about the conga line <laughs> that formed in the procession, everyone singing and dancing, exulting in the triumph of this new era in our church. Now please hear me. I am a member of a gay couple, and in 2015, I was just beginning to discern the priesthood in both the vocation of my marriage and the vocation of my work in the church. I am deeply grateful that the Episcopal Church has taken this bold and good step. Andrew and I renewed our vows in an Episcopal Church in 2016, and it's lovely to be accepted as an equal. It's lovely that people are mostly bored by the fact that I am a gay married priest. <laughs> but I didn't like that conga line all the same. It felt smug. I thought to myself, we have paid for this victory with precious blood. Thousands of our siblings in the faith have left us. Now maybe we are inspired to say good riddance, and if so, I can empathize with that. I have felt that. Some of them said and did awful things, but others were more circumspect, and they truly struggled with this issue. They were faithful. They may have simply not been ready to bear this new teaching from Jesus. And yes, I believe that the full inclusion of all persons, regardless of sexual identity and orientation, is a teaching that we receive from the Creator, through Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I do want us to celebrate, but I don't like it when we gloat. Holy wisdom calls to us. She raises her voice at the crossroads where we part company with those who disagree with us. She cries out to all who live, all who live. She tells us that she was there at the beginning of creation, and she is the delight of the Creator. Wisdom is God's master worker, God's delight, God's companion in rejoicing. Creator, Word, and Spirit rejoice in this world so flush with life, and they take particular delight in the human race. We are invited into this celebration. And for all I know, I was unduly concerned that day back in 2015, and I was just being uptight. I can be uptight, as you may have noticed by now. <laughs> Maybe the conga line was inspired by God's delight in the whole created world and in the human race. I hope so, and I don't want to be grumpy or discouraging. But I wonder what Holy Wisdom is saying to us. I hear her voice in the words of Jesus, who teaches us that there is always more that we do not know, and that we cannot bear some of the things that we do not yet know. Maybe the joyful deputies at that General Convention Eucharist were not yet ready to know that there was cause for concern 
that their celebration was problematic. But maybe I was the problem. Maybe I was not yet ready to know that all was well. And I was worrying about something for no good reason. As I reflect on all this, I come back to my grandmother. Maybe she was ready to know the full story about her third grandson. And it was Uncle Ray who wasn't ready to know that octogenarians can take in new information yeah. and respond well <laughs> to it. Yeah, get an amen on that. Uncle Ray had turned 61 later that year. I remember him being profoundly intelligent, and so he was. But what at 60 was he still too young to know? Holy wisdom cries out to us, revealing herself to us, inviting us into the celebrations of the Holy Three, who find so much to love in this wondrous world, and particularly the sentient humans who inhabit it. But her cry to us is not just an invitation to celebrate. It is also a lovely invitation into humility. We are invited to wonder what we do not know and why we are not yet ready to know it. Holy wisdom invites us to stop and breathe and listen. We are about to learn something new. Together, let us affirm our faith. We believe in God above us, maker and sustainer of all life, of sun and moon, of water and earth, of all humanity. We believe in God beside us, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, born of a woman's womb, servant of the poor. He was tortured and nailed to a tree. Knowing full passion and deep sorrow, he died forsaken. He descended into the earth to the place of death. On the third day, he rose from the tomb. He ascended into heaven to be everywhere present, one day be known. We believe in God within us, the Holy Spirit of Pentecostal fire, life-giving breath of the church. She is the spirit of healing and forgiveness, source of resurrection and of life everlasting. Amen. Jesus said, I still have many things to say to you. The spirit of truth will guide you into all the truth. 
Let us pray to the holy and undivided Trinity, Creator, Word, and Holy Spirit. Your majesty is praised above the heavens. We give thanks for being alive and for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Holy Three, hear our prayer. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Guide our prejudices and fears toward understanding and empathy. Holy Three, hear our prayer. You have set up a stronghold against your adversaries. God, protect and give hope to all whose lives are disrupted through war and persecution. Holy Three, hear our prayer. Does not wisdom call, and does not understanding raise her voice? Guide us with wisdom to seek a rector who leads with inclusion, discovery, service, and gratitude. Holy Three, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for those in need, sorrow, or any kind of adversity. We pray for healing for Mary Lou, Shelley, Susan, Barbara, David, Ted, Elizabeth, Stacy, Glenna, Nell, Beverly, Marianne, Brian, Marguerite M, Carson, Julie, Doug, Mike, Lynn, Susie, Ken, and Dina. We pray for support for Paul and Monica, Cora, Dave, Marilyn, Rebecca, Bernard, Kathy, Andrew, Mario, and Susan, Debbie, Barbara's family, Susan, Martha, Gary, Alyssa, and Ashley, Tracy, Sarah, and Lauren, Robin, Beth, Dave, and Steph. We give thanks for the members of the Profile Committee. We pray for peace for Mario, Jerry, Mary Ann, Mark, and Sharon. And we give thanks for the life of Nora, Jenny, Susie, Joe, and Jim. Holy Three, hear our prayer. On the feast of the Holy Trinity, O oh God, receive our prayers, fulfill our hopes, and send us from here to serve our neighbor with gladness. Give peace. Give peace. 
The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Peace. Peace. Good to see you. You're so great. You're so great. I felt heartened when I saw you in the crowd. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Do it. Do it. We. So we have an announcement, but then, yeah. Do you need the podium? Okay. Oh. <laughs> so let's chill for a second. The so warden has an announcement. Yeah, it just got richer. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. What's that? Not yet. Luke's going to use it. Please be seated. We'll give it, there we go. Um, I hope you guys aren't sick of me yet. Um, we've, we've, Heather and I have been up here taking a few minutes during the various services to reflect on some of the challenges that recent rectors have experienced at Grace. And this has led to a few questions from you all that I thought I would attempt to answer today. One question that's come up a lot is, did Grace conduct an exit interview with Wren? Oh, did, did Grace conduct an exit interview with Wren? The answer is we did. Wren talked at some length with both the vestry and with the PMC before announcing, between announcing her new call and her final day at Grace. The feedback she's provided has been shared with the profile committee and will also be shared with the call committee. A second question is, why aren't you telling us what she said? <laughs> <laughs> we are. The answer is we are. Her feedback was kind and loving and also very personal, and so we aren't sharing it word for word. But the goal of these talks is to share and explore some of what we've learned in talking with her. The issues that we've been discussing are ones that she has mentioned, and other rectors have concurred, and other priests at Grace have said have been issues for them. Um, We've talked about various ways to, to discuss this, but we find that, you know, very few of us regularly read all the e-news or attend talks after church and such. So having these quick conversations on Sundays is the way that we hope to reach the most people with the same, con with the same content, if that makes sense. Okay, and then the last question, but why? Why did she leave? <laughs> and that's complicated, I think. Uh, I think it's important to stop and think about yourself and the major life decisions that you've made, right? It's easy to want to pick one thing, one problem, but life is not like that. There's a lot of considerations in the decisions we make, especially the large ones. Um, for Ren, it was a mix of a lot of things, but I can <coughs> name three that might be helpful, right? One is the challenges at Grace. Another is the challenges of living on Bainbridge Island which is a very specific type of community and she didn't always feel like a full part of. Um, and others are some personal considerations of hers, both preferences and family needs and those sorts of things. When I think about those three, right, there's, there's not that much we can do about Bainbridge as a whole or individuals' considerations, but we do have the power to address some of the challenges here at Grace. And, and that's really the, the thing that we're trying to address in these conversations. I think it can be really hard to hold this paradox 
of just how much Ren loved this community, how much she loved each of you, and also her needing to make a change. But I think that's really, really critical, right? That's the healthy relationship aspect that we want to make sure that we can hold on to as we also think about welcoming new rectors. Um, and in this process of, of reflecting on this, on what a rector might need from us, let's remember we're not doing it completely alone. We're a people of faith. And maybe not perfect faith. <laughs> it's easy to feel like we're doing this all on our own. But we have to trust that God is working through us and that we can't see it all right now. So let's keep the conversation going this summer. We'll, we'll keep talking. I think it's great if you hear these things and you want to argue with me about it, go for it. If you want to talk to your friends and neighbors about it, I think those are healthy things and I encourage us to keep thinking and processing and uh, preparing. And in a way, all of this is, is a way for us to be ready for the next rector to welcome them and to be open to whatever challenges they bring forward and to say we're a great place and we'll have our rough edges and we can do what we can to soften those for you in the way that you need. So thanks for listening. God walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God. Oh,
please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. All thanks and praise are yours at all times and in all places, our true and loving God, through Jesus Christ, your eternal word, the wisdom from on high by whom you created all things. You laid the foundations of the world and enclosed the sea when it burst out from the womb. You brought forth all creatures of the earth and gave breath to humankind. Wondrous are you, holy one of blessing. All you create is a sign of hope for our journey. And so as the morning stars sing your praises, we join the heavenly beings and all creation as we shout with joy. creator of all, your word has never been silent. You called a people to yourself as a light to the nations. You delivered them from bondage and led them to a land of promise. Of your grace, you gave Jesus to be human, to share our life, to proclaim the coming of your holy reign and give himself for us, a fragrant offering. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, you have freed us from sin, brought us into your life, reconciled us to you and restored us to the glory you intend for us. We thank you that on the night before he died for us, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his friends and said, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, said the blessing, gave it to his friends and said, drink this, all of you, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And so remembering all that was done for us, the cross, the tomb, the resurrection and ascension, longing for Christ's coming in glory and presenting to you these gifts your earth has formed and human hands have made, we acclaim you, O Christ. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Christ Jesus, come in glory. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine, that they may be to us the body and blood of your Christ. Grant that we, burning with the Spirit's power, may be a people of hope, justice, and love, giver of life. Draw us together in the body of Christ. And in the fullness of time, gather us with all your people into the joy of our true eternal home through Christ, and with Christ, and in Christ, by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, we worship you, our God and Creator, in voices of unending praise. Blessed are you, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. So leave us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. The gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us pray. God of abundance, you have fed us with the bread of life and cup of salvation. You have united us with Christ and one another, and you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. I invite you to come forward if you'd like to celebrate with us a birthday or anniversary that you are experiencing today or this week. The microphone went here. What I'll ask you to do is turn around and face the people and say your name so that everyone knows who you are and what you're celebrating. We'll start with Michael. Well, my, as you all know, I went through a, a very serious separation from my children 29 years ago. My ex-wife shut me out. And after a long legal battle, Paul Kuntz helping me for much of it, I prevailed in the Court of Appeals. The, the, the court ordered her to enforce my visitation, which had, she had ignored. And uh, there was no finding of fact of any kind against me. But nevertheless, the boys were completely alienated. And uh, I really have not seen them or heard from them. I, I vaguely know what's, what's going on from other people. But uh, three weeks ago, my oldest son, Hawk, contacted me. And now I hear from him like twice a day by email. And he turns 41 next Wednesday. So, I mean, I've, 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 I've stood my ground and I've stood by for 29 years. And, you know, and I, I really have had to let go and let God. And finally, you know, after all that time, things seem to be, you know, improving. I just wanted you all to know. My name is Liz Powell, and um, I have three nieces and nephews, one who graduated from high school, from college, and grad school in the past couple of weeks. Good morning. I'm Terry Jones. And on June 6th, I turned 65. And on June 6th, my son turned 39. I'm Wendy Tyner, and last Wednesday at 4 a.m., I got a phone call from Adam, our 33-year-old, letting us know that I'm now a baba for a second time. So uh, little Jack was born into this world. Great. And the Maxwell's grandson, Nick, has a birthday. Super. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this day, for adding it to our lives, for the gifts of life and love and relationship. We ask your blessing on this prayer shawl, on the hands that crafted it, and on all who will benefit from the prayers that are raised with it. And we ask your prayers upon these, your servants, as they celebrate another year of life and love for those they love and for they themselves. Be with them, fill them with grace and power. Send them from here with joy and with truth and with gladness. Amen. And now may the blessing of the God of Abraham and Sarah and of Jesus Christ, born of our sister Mary, and of the Holy Spirit who broods over the world as a mother over her children be upon you and remain with you always.
in peace to love and serve the Lord.